That group of guys, uh, go for broke, you know, they, he, he's gone all out. Well, the same tradition kind of carried over into armies. Come on, go for broke. He said, you charge up to here, go for broke. So it's a, it became a model, as you found out, as uh, go for broke, no hold back, that same attitude, don't be reserved, go all out, yeah. And because we had one model like that, I think it kind of helped us fight together, you know. When you hear that go for broke, you, know, you get your adrenaline up, you know. Oh, look out, Tommy! Oh, I got a big family to take you a, a, a couple of hours just talking about them. But my parents came from Shodoshima, Japan. It's an uh, inland sea. And uh, my father came first and my uh, mother came later on. But uh, uh, I have 10 brothers and sisters. My uh, 11th one died, so I still have 11, 10. To start with, my uh, parents were on Irvine ranches in California, and they had the alien land law passed and uh, driven us out of our Irvine ranch uh, homestead. And my, uh, there's six families moved to Southern Nevada, about 50 miles north of Las Vegas. And that's where I grew up, grammar school and high school. And it was a little, little small burg community, so to speak, yeah. Pearl Harbor was on December 7, 1941, and uh, I was uh, in finishing up senior year. I uh, graduated in 42, so I was finishing up my senior year. Uh, as soon as the war started, uh, all my classmates, uh, white classmates, should I say, were being inducted into the service or the volunteer service. Whereas uh, I was not allowed to go into service because of the uh, classification of 4C, which they put on all of the Japanese Americans as if we were aliens. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan.
I was raised in a in a basically a Mormon community, and they were very tolerant of any any racial, especially the Japanese. So when the war war started, Pearl Harbor war started. The people in the valley, we call it valley because it encased a couple of communities. They were very tolerant. In fact, they went out of the way to assure you that everything is going to be all right. So, so 966, which ordered all the Japanese Americans into camp, it didn't affect me as much. And in those days, uh, we didn't have nice paper like Ralph Shimpo. <laughs> so we, we had this, even hearsay, Pearl Harbor was so far the, removed from our daily activities. I don't know how much uh, attention we paid to it. We were eligible for the draft, but since we were 4C, we, we had no choice but to wait our turn. And I think the group in Hawaii were able to get their uh, 4C lifted. And in the mainland, it took a little longer for us to get in a position where we will be eligible for the draft. For C, you are an enemy alien, so you're not eligible for the draft. So that's the situation as I was told or remembered. Prior to lifting of the order, uh, we were already enlisted. So it was a question of whether, whether they will release us to active service or not. And we were enemy alien at that to till that point. Well, I, I think to begin with, we all pretty much trained together. And when, when you train together, you become a family together. And I think because of this reason, uh, you, you're watching for your friends on the left and right, as well as in the front. Uh, you dedicate to each other more than had we had just just replacements come in. For me, it was enjoyable. I, if you can put up with the sergeants and ordering you around, as as everybody might tell you that uh, we were privates and we're the you get kicked around a little bit by the. Non-coms, non-coms are non-commissioned officers, and they they did all the training for us. Yeah. They didn't know where where we stood in uh, as far as the racial thing. If you you get on a bus and you see all those. Empty seat in the back, and you go sit down over there. She says, "Hey, you can't. They're, they're for the niggers, you know." And uh, there's a lot of racial, but they didn't. They didn't know where to where to fit us. Uh, to to begin with, there's very few Oriental or let alone Japanese Americans living west of. Uh, 
east of uh, the Mississippi, I would say. So they didn't know how to treat us. We went over your Europe on a troop transport, Liberty, Liberty ship, and it took us 21, 21 days, and we landed in Maples, Italy. And by then, uh, Naples Harbor was struck, so it, it was kind of little experience of seeing war for us anyway. Our first position was in outside of Naples, Italy, a town named Bagnoli, Bagnoli, I think it was. And we assembled there more or less to prepare for war. So that's where we were, and our first action was uh, <coughs> near south of Rome little community named Civita Vecchia. Yeah, that's our first action. Well, I think if I remember correctly, and I do, that we marched through this, uh, you could smell the uh, death, if there is such thing as smelling death, uh, a burnt tank, you walk by a burnt tank and you see your bodies laying Germans as well as Americans, your own soldiers that you train with, seeing them lying on the side of the street, maybe a head would be shattered or something like that and it, it leaves an impression on you. So that's one of the Horrors of war, I guess. Our first war was in Italy, and it was real mountainous. So the Germans being there uh, much earlier than we, they had all the good visual positions. So they could see us walking up the valley, and they'll pepper us with ammunition. Whereas we had to kind of out, outskirt them or outwit them by going around them or something like that. Yes, it's, it wasn't pleasant at all first, uh, first. Then after we fought a while, then you pretty much expect that and so you start to be war weary about that. Every, every company has to have a Makita because he, he, he's, he, he's, he, he, come on, get a match? Then he, sure, here's a match. Get a cigarette? <laughs> he's one, one of these guys that you, you, you got to love him, but yet you, you, they'll say, here comes Makita. Yeah. So I, I can't isolate any one individual that I always feel for those guys that lost their lives, that missed out on post-reunion. After the war was over, we had the most heck of a time getting reacquainted under peacetime treaty. And I believe, to me, that's one of the rewards of war is to enjoy the peace afterward.
France is altogether different, you know. Uh, we come from the wood uh, slopes of Italy, where you have quite a quite a vision. We're going to France, and it's actually northeastern France in the Vosges Mountains and forests, and it was dense. Very, very poor visibility, so you you can't. It's altogether a different type of a fighting you had to do, and the Germans would fire, and hit trees, trees you get more damage from uh, shrapnels hitting the trees, and trees falling down and injuring all the guys. Uh, this didn't happen in, in Italy. I think uh, we could the word is out that uh, 442nd was after them. I don't know whether the Germans either laid down their arm, but it, I, really uh, there wasn't much battle to reaching them. Uh, most of the injuries and stuff like that was uh, some of them were even our shells that would prematurely hit the trees and then when you ever hit a tree, artillery shell will burst into many pieces and those are the damaging. Very seldom you had a, somebody with a sniper through a dark wooded area being able to hit us individually. It's mostly the shrapnels from the artillery shells. That France was such a Dismal, uh, you can't see any terrain. So we were kind of happy to be, see the mountains and the sea on one side. So uh, I believe, uh, for my part, I, I, I was happy to be back in Italy. Uh, France uh, was no place to be caught because it was dreary all the time. In the last battalion, last campaign was a campaign in Italy, and we, we climbed a sheer wall or mountain shall I say, and caught the Germans off guard. But I recall grabbing shrubberies, maybe somebody's kicking the rocks above you and here comes a boulder comes down, they'll keep hollering, watch out! And then you could hear the boulder pick up speed and somebody, or, or, Someone is not able to get out of the way, got injured, went to hospital right away. I recall starting out, it was still daylight. And as day break, we got daylight, we had to be on top. That was our objective, otherwise we'd be on the halfway up the slope and the Germans all they had to turn their guns around and shoot us, shoot us up. So 
our objective was to, we got to be on top by the daylight. So to catch the Germans off guard who were looking the other way. And we were, they were kind of half sleeping because they didn't expect us to come up the back way like that. We, uh, we caught them off guard, so to speak, by coming up the back way. And uh, according to generals there, they claimed the 442nd had ended that section of the war much earlier than it would have had it not been for that coming up the rear side and having a surprise attack from the rear. Realized we, we were coming up the back slope, they turned their guns around, but they, can, they couldn't do anything. They were all positioned to, in a forward position and watching us for coming up the slope on the front side, which was a much, much, much nigher, more, uh, not as steep as, we, as the back slope, yeah. Last days of overseas, let's see, I had a group of my men go back uh, one of the most cherished uh, trips after the war was uh, seeing Switzerland. And I turned down a Switzerland pass so I can get home by Christmas. And actually, you, you remember Christmas as you did before you went in the war. So I was hurrying to try to get Christmas. Guess who I released my Switzerland pass to? I saw him in civilian clothes in Salt Lake City near Fort Douglas, Utah. I'm, I'm still in uniform yet. I didn't get home till January the 5th. And that's the war, war I, I had hopes to get home by Christmas. Um, in St. Louis, New Year's Eve, I'm on the tr train on a siding going home where everybody's uh, having New Year's Eve parties, stuff like that, yeah. All of you Americans of Japanese descent have a right to be proud today. You have demonstrated true Americanism and true American citizenship on the field of battle. You have realized the necessity of coming to this distant land and leaving your homes and your loved ones in order that you could destroy this enemy who would take from you the American way of life and the freedoms which we value so highly in America. You have another right to be proud for you have reached the high standards of American fighting men. You are always willing to close with the enemy. He has no bluff on you, and you've always defeated him. And let me tell you again, the 34th Division is proud of you. The 5th Army is proud of you. America is proud of you. And I know that whatever future action you go into, you will conduct yourselves with glory and bring about the peace that we are entitled to. Good luck to you, and God bless you. This year has been full of many positive and negative experiences. Vet Doc has taught me what hard work and dedication is. Vet Doc taught me that it's okay to fail if you learn from your failures to improve. But above all of that, 
Jim Yamashita taught me to go for broke, to go all out, to not hold back and give it all I have. Thank you for being an inspiration, as well as a reason why I had to finish my documentary. Hearing your stories, as well as finding information about what you and your battalion went through amazes me. When your country turned their back on you, you pressed onward. When you were forced to fight in World War II for your redemption, you pressed onwards. You gave me the inspiration to press onwards and push through all the times that I felt my documentary wasn't good enough. This class is about the experience and what you can do for the men and their families that gave up so much for their countries so that students like myself can live a relatively carefree life. So once again, thank you, Jim Yamashita.